we're facing globally some of the, I mean, it's a predicament. It's it's not just a problem. It's a predicament of you know ecological crisis and climate disruption and and you know we're in the midst of a pandemic. You know, I mean, there's just numerous crises that are playing out, and it's just like so obvious that this can't work. It doesn't work. It's never worked, and it it it's certainly you know as, as they would say, you know, the hens are coming home to roost. Kind of that's what it feels like. So right now, I think people are. There's two things, two two reactions, which is to hold on even more tightly to the dominant culture and the values of the dominant culture, which we're seeing <laughs> pretty pretty obviously right now, and also a real openness is happening because people's hearts are breaking open and they're seeing like how can this be? This can't be, and so I think there feels like we're being pulled, and this might be um, lacking nuance, but it feels like we're being pulled in almost two different directions, where people one sense that everybody's sense of something is wrong, but how we re- respond to that wrongness. And so, you know, there's these systems of wisdom and knowledge that are just right there, you know, and we have to know how to learn them again or remember them. And for me, that's something I, I come up against all the time, which is like, I feel like I know this, but I don't know this, <laughs> you know, it's this, interesting in-betweenness that I, I feel and I think many people feel. And I think when we read books like this uh, book that you put together, Restoring the Kinship Worldview, it's like, um, it's almost like an ancestral memory is kind of re-emerging, you know, because while I say I'm not indigenous to this land, my ancestors were indigenous to some place, right? Um, and how to tap into that is really the the biggest question that we need to be asking right now. And I think many one, of the... One thing that you said yeah. earlier was about how, um, is there a non-duality problem? Mm-hmm. And, and and there is. If you if you look at the scholarship on worldview, you see people that have said, said that the dominant worldview and the Western worldview are binary worldviews. They're really a strong either or absolute, with mm-hmm. one absolute wrong, absolute right. And you'll see that most will say the indigenous worldview is a non-binary worldview. And you look at the at, at, at the work of uh, a number of, of people like Hillary Webb, um, who have written dissertations on this. And so, and that's kind of gets to what we were saying about there's got to be something about the technology that we can use, right? And in, and that's what we in the worldview chart, we don't put it up as a as a as an absolute right and wrong. It, we see it as a continuum. Uh, and so, like, for example, in, in hierarchy, there are times when the Lakota and a buffalo hunt will have rigid hierarchy. Mm-hmm. And then but that the leader will be a different person each time. And then when they go back to their, their communities, that that's gone. Right. So we look at this as a continuum and contextual. It opens up dialogue instead of shutting it down like the old worldview debates between science and religion did. So I think trying to figure out what being in the middle, you know, is a good place to be right. Trying mm-hmm. to get in that center and find where it is. I just got back from being with the Kogi and, and the first thing they do is they put a bead on each, on each wrist to remind you of the polarities mm. and how that we've got to keep them in balance. And, you know, and, and so how do we do that? Mm-hmm. You know, I mean, the Hopis have a prophecy uh, and, uh, and uh, a number of other cultures, share it, uh, which is interesting, that our species has been given uh, seven to nine times, depending on which one, which mythology you believe. And uh, that each we've, we're in a fifth world. And that four times before the humans got, as you, you said, Patrick, uh, they got arrogant. Mm-hmm. They separated from nature, felt that because of their imagination and their use of fingers that they could that they were greater than nature. And in each time there was a catastrophe. The last one was a, a, a great flood. Right. And so can we and, and they say that, you know, we've got these other options and and starting over can be easier or, or harder, depending on how much we wake up. Mm-hmm. Um, so that's not you know, I don't see that as a hope that we can turn things around. But. Uh, uh, the insistence that whatever we're doing is the right thing to do, regardless of the outcome, that it's going to help people rebuild. Mm -hmm. So uh, one of the big 
things that the Western world has done is is just to emphasize and practice disconnection, mm-hmm. whether it's science or religion or it's a disconnecting humans from their hearts, <laughs> from their bodies, from intuition, from raising it well, uh, from you know relating to others, relating to nature, this connection over all over the place. And so one of the healing practices is to, to practice reconnecting and, and nature connection, immerse yourself, right? And mm-hmm. uh, find the ways that you are can connect with whoever you're with, wherever you are, find the oneness, whatever that is, because we're all one. Mm-hmm. <laughs> we're all interrelating and sharing viruses and bacteria mm-hmm. and everything is moving in, in dyna- dynamic. We just haven't uh, built our brains to recognize it. So that's another p- missing piece. When you uh, undermine child development, you're undermining that receptive intelligence of, you know, yeah. awareness of the communications uh, among all of nature and uh, tel- telepathy and such. So um, right. to get back in your body here and now and connect where you are, right? That's the healing. That's the start of healing. Right. Can I share just a, a real brief story of what Absolutely. just happened this morning, just before this call? Mm-hmm. So my five-year-old and eight-year-old, we, you know, it's been great. They're just amazing kids, and it's just been a joy to be with them. But this morning, uh, they they were getting a little, you know, on each other, like brothers and sisters will. And the young, the eight-year-old boy kind of grabbed the sandwich from the little girl and said something about, you said I could have a bite or whatever. <laughs> And, and, and actually scratch her. Huh. I saw that, you know, as a violent act. And, uh, and so I went outside and they had just discovered about an hour earlier, giant hermit crab, but it was about this big. And I was just walking across the sand. And uh, so I went and, and found it and saw where it was. And I, I, I said, right, come here. I said, go get that little lounge chair over there. And, would you sit down next to this hermit crab? And I want you to sit there and watch it and think about it and learn from it telepathically if necessary, because by that time it had gone inside its shell and come in and let Darsh and let um, uh, Corey and I know when you've come up with three things you can learn about the mistake that you just made. So he went and sat down in it. And it's really the first disciplinary act the whole in the whole like 16 days they've been here, right? Mm-hmm. But, um, they're getting ready to leave. And I think they're getting anxious about going back to their, mm-hmm. their family. Dad, dad, dad and mom are divorced, you know. Mm-hmm. And so um, he went and sat there for at least 45 minutes. And then he came to came in. He says, can I tell you? I said, yeah. I said, but let your sister come. So we came. And he said, this is so, it's so cool. I'm all, I just felt the tear get in my eye. <laughs> he says, well, grandfather, he says, I kind of learned, I'm not know if it was telepathic or whatever, but I kind of felt he told me that, you know, I shouldn't give so much attention to, to, to the things that are making me angry. Mm. I said, mm. yeah, that's interesting. He, I said, did he ever come out and look at you? So he never did. <laughs> mm. Mm. And, and, and then he said, and, uh, and I should learn to, uh, to, you know, just get back inside myself and kind of think about, about things when, uh, when I have fear or anger. And I thought, wow, what a beautiful thing to learn mm. from this, this creature. Right. Mm. And I think that's what, that's what we used to do. And we can still do it. Uh, you know, the yoga traditions try to get us to do that, um, you know, to bring us back. And so anyway, thanks yeah. for letting me share that. Just, oh. I, just, I thought this is perfect. From what no, no, that's, saying. that is perfect. And that actually brings up something for me, which is, um, you know, when you, when you, both of you have mentioned telepathy, I mean, a part of me is just like rejecting that idea. Like how can two people or multiple people connect and share thoughts? Like that doesn't, it, you know, there's this part of me that's like, that doesn't make sense. But then there's another part of me that's like, well, I consider myself to be fairly intuitive as a person. And I've actually had to lean in and into it more and more because I realized I had, I've suppressed that part of myself for most of my life for, you know, because I've been described as being sensitive or whatever, you know, I, I feel things more intensely than maybe other people seem to. And I don't know if that's true. I think they maybe have suppressed it more than I have, but you know, when you talk about your grandchild basically learning something from a crab, I mean, that's, 
you're you're encouraging something that comes naturally to children it just needs to be it needs to be encouraged and so i just wanted to speak to that thing that came up in me which is oh telepathy telepathy sounds superstitious and weird but also like i kind of am able to intuit things <laughs> as well so it's it's like i think sometimes even the framing of how we talk about this within say the english language can be it can be difficult to communicate ideas that are just obvious and very real for through an indigenous or, or uh, yeah, uh, an indigenous perspective. It may be very obvious through that perspective, but through a maybe more Western, Western dominant worldview, it just feels absurd. And that tension, I think, is very, very present. And I just wanted to speak to that. Yeah. Another way to talk about it is your animal senses. We, mm. we undermine the development of our animal senses within when we're raised in cities and um, mm. without a connection to wildness, right, mm. in, in the natural world. And uh, John Young uh, and his colleagues have written uh, books uh, and have webinars about how to increase those senses. Mm. And I've used them with my college students and classes. Uh, Tamarack Song also has a bunch of different things. You play some games where you, you know, someone, uh, one of the practices was to um, have a circle of people standing and one person in the middle blindfolded. And then one of the people in the circle is going to pretend to be a predator and, and act that out, you know, with energy, but no sound, right? Uh, and see if the person in the center can figure out who it is that's emitting that energy. And, and some people, you know, are already able to do that, but it just takes practice to get uh, aware of the energies around you. Uh, I used to start out my classes that way, Darsha, at Northern Arizona University. Uh, from, I hadn't thought about this, but I, I, I did it in my social methods of social studies class. I would walk into the room and I'd say, I'd like to do an experiment before we get to know each other. And I'm going to ask one person to volunteer to come up in front of the room. And I'm going to have another person volunteer to ask the entire class to look away from her, look outside the window and ignore her completely. When that person says to do that, and then when she points to the person, I want you to look to that person and send them all the loving thoughts and kind thoughts that you can give that person. And I swear, I mean, three, two or three years I did this for every, every first class. It would be something like 70, 80 percent correct that the person that was up there guessed she would say or he would say they're looking at me. They're not looking at me. They're looking at me. They're not looking at me. Hmm. Now, if that's not an example of what the word telepathy means, mm -hmm. I don't know what it mm -hmm. is. Right? And I could give a whole bunch of other stories, but mm -hmm. that's just one that came to me. Sure. Yeah, I just I just think, of you know, again, these words can sometimes clumsily define something that you know, it's, yeah, you know, whether we've called intuition or, or just a sense or, you know, whatever, there's, there's much more to the human, human beings ability to sense their environment and their connection to other beings. A lot of that's the problem of the English language, which sure. is a noun based language sure. that was designed 9,000 years ago to talk about human organization. Mm -hmm. If you look at indigenous languages, they all come from the earth. They're all verb based. Mm -hmm. you, they're all very difficult to concretize and pigeonhole mm -hmm. down there. You know, to, to describe a tree is three or four sentences. The, the calendars of the Lakota, you know, there's two sentences on top to describe the month. I mean, it's a very different thing. Uh, and so it is difficult and we have right. to redefine things. So if I talk about hypnosis uh, and, and medical hypnosis, like I wasn't allowed by Prentice Hall to use that word for my book on emergency hypnosis. I wasn't allowed to use the mm -hmm. word hypnosis. Now it's getting republished after 25 years. And I insist that it be used because we, there are if, if scholars can look at the history of hypnosis. And, and if, they're, if they're taught to get past the malarkey and the Hollywood and all that kind of mm -hmm. stuff, we sure. at least have something to work with and, because we're not going to learn indigenous languages, right? So it's it's tricky business, that, and, and I think the linguistics of of, of worldview study, it, this is an important topic to have on the table. So I'm glad you brought it up. Mm -hmm. 
in part, uh, could we call it primal awareness? You primal used that awareness. term before, right? So telepathy, primal awareness, animal senses. Mm -hmm.